Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us today Dr Terry Janke uh, to deliver the keynote unpacking how and why collections should be adopting cultural protocols, consultation and consent processes in how they work with First Nations communities. Uh, Terry is a Wadathi Merriam woman recognised internationally as an authority on Indigenous cultural intellectual property. Terry and her firm, Terry Jenkin Company, are known for innovating pathways between the law and cultural rights for Indigenous people. Terry will tell us about the True Tracks protocols today. Following Terry, uh, we'll have two case studies of organisations working with First Peoples communities to manage ICIP in collections. Uh, Karen, Mount, uh, Karen Mountain, uh, is a project officer with the Call Collection, uh, an, indigenous in, an Australian Indigenous Languages collection held by the Bachelor Institute for Indigenous Tertiary Education in the Northern Territory. Uh, she will detail how Bachelor Institute and the Call Collection have engaged with the True Tracks protocols. Uh, Kristen Thorpe will then follow with a discussion of Indigenous self-determination in libraries and archives and the need to centre Indigenous priorities and voices in collections practice. Uh, Kristen is a Waramai woman and a senior researcher at the Jum uh, Jumbana, is that how you say it? Jumbana uh, Institute for Indigenous Education and Research and is a PhD candidate at Monash University investigating the question of Indigenous cultural safety in Australian libraries and archives. So I'll hand over now to Terry uh, and we'll follow straight on to the case studies and then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Elliot, for that introduction. Debbie Keepham, everybody, um, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people of the Canberra region and all First Nations people who are here today. And hello to everybody. Um, it's really great to be asked to be here. Thanks, Elliot and Jessica, for your interest in this topic. Uh, um, it's also good to catch up with many people who I've known throughout the years and who've been great supporters of this work over many years. Thank you so much for your interest in this topic. Um, it's now 20 years since I started my firm, Terry Janke and Company, which I think people thought was a bit of a risk at the time. Um, where would you get uh, the clients from to work in an area that is about advising people on their Indigenous intellectual property rights. Well, I'm glad to say that I'm still in business. <laughs> if only just, no. Um, there's 14 of us now and we do work all around Australia with Indigenous organisations and also government departments. But our, our goal is to empower people in, with knowledge about Indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights. And um, we also work with Indigenous businesses to develop Indigenous um, business legal skills with them. So I'm going to talk um, today about the work that we do and in the context of how Indigenous cultural and intellectual property applies to digital collections. So uh, hands up who's working with a digital collection. So uh, great. Anyone working in libraries? Yep. And how many of you have got online um, databases with Indigenous content? Okay, so there's a lot of you there. Good. Well, today I'm going to talk about Indigenous engagement, but through the lens of the work that I did, or my team did, for the Australian Museums and Galleries Association, the First Peoples Roadmap for Indigenous Engagement, and then I'm going to talk about copyright, but I know a lot of you already are well across copyright, but I'm going to sort of match it with Indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights and how it fits with digital collections, and then make some suggestions about how better to engage with Indigenous people's knowledge. And I'll go through the True Tracks <laughs> principles that we are working with our clients on. So the project that we did on the Indigenous Roadmap, uh, we started in 2017. We were successful tenderers um, for, it was then Museums Galleries Australia, but now the Australian Museums and Galleries Association. 
And the brief was basically to look at Indigenous engagement in museums and galleries, but also it was two levels. It was about representation, but also participation by Indigenous people in museums and galleries. So we did an audit and a literature review and did consultations and the task was to develop a 10 year roadmap, which we did and it's available on the website down the bottom there. And we also updated the uh, principles and guidelines that that association has. It's currently called Continuing Cultures and Ongoing Responsibilities, but it did have in its first uh, life it was called Previous Possessions, New Obligations. How many of you know those policy documents? So a few of you know about it. Good. Well, at the moment, Amaga is uh, consulting on the update, which uh, we're calling First Peoples and Connecting Custodians. But um, we uh, travelled a lot that year, or it was a year and a half, and went to about 15 workshops or more, met with interest groups, some of you, I think, were involved in those uh, workshops or, or gave written submissions. We had an issues paper, but we, con we connected out as widely as we could to consult on how the sector deals with Indigenous engagement. And first of all, to start off, we looked at where are we now. So I'm going with the, uh, the roadmap um, theme there. You can see there are at crossroads. Uh, Marcus Hughes, who is uh, the Indigenous Engagement Officer at the Museum of Applied of Arts and Sciences, he went well into this, when we did the first workshop in Sydney, he went well into this um, analogy about the roadmap. He would say, oh, Terry, we've got to talk about, you know, um, where are we going, the destination? How do we get there, the vehicle? Who's coming with us, the passengers? And what do we leave behind the baggage? And I said, no, we'll leave that one out. <laughs> but um, it was interesting because it's a sector that has had a lot of um, sort of disharmony between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Indigenous people find museums and galleries are very colonial and a lot of the stuff collected from a time where we had no voice and were seen as like the plants and animals. And it was you know, a lot of the stuff collected in colonisation. So building trust within that sort of space is, is difficult. When we looked at where we are now, we focused on engagement and we surveyed the institutions and asked them how they thought they engaged. And 51% said fair, 26% excellent, and 22% said poor. And you can see there in the box it has the percentages of the different types of activities that museums and galleries are undertaking in Indigenous engagement. Um, only 21% have reconciliation action plans. But when we went out and spoke to the Indigenous communities, it was still really apparent to me that they did not know what was in the institutions, they did not feel confident walking into the institutions. If they ever went in there, they felt like they couldn't engage with the cultural objects were there. They were worried about how their intellectual property and knowledge was being used. But they realised the importance of that content for their continuing cultural practice. And that's important historically because of the treatment of Indigenous people, the dispossession, and you know, the eradication of languages, the massacres, all of that, it becomes extremely important for Indigenous people to connect with records that these cultural institutions hold. It's not just records, but objects. And all of that content that uh, connects us to, to our ancestors. And about 85% of Indigenous people that we spoke to wanted this closer, greater connection. And it became apparent to me at the very first point that there was a difference between what institutions see as engagement and what the deeper engagement that uh, Indigenous communities are after. So there is a report online which you can go and get more detail. And the roadmap itself is on the website. But what we found was that the, there were limitations in the current approach. So engagement is very transactional. So it is reactive to uh, a tick of the box style and it's very surface level. And even though there is Indigenous people employed in institutions, 
You know, they might be curators or Indigenous um, officers that are starting at very base levels. There was uh, discussions that we had with them about the lack of cultural safety and that lack of systemic support. So when I'm talking about no cultural safety, I'm talking about people working in these institutions feel like in a bit of a bind, they work for the institution, but they also are connected to communities, they have these relationships, um, they are there for their knowledge about communities, but they might not be taken seriously. Or one uh, worker has described to me is that I'm the one that has to answer all the questions, but I may not know them all because you know, I come from one country, one nation, but not all. And she described it that she felt like the black Google, which I thought was a really funny way to describe it. But Indigenous people that go into these uh, organisations aren't given pathways to progress to higher levels. So that needs to be addressed. And a really good thing about uh, the consultations was that we found there were a lot of non-Indigenous workers that wanted to help in this space. They understood the need for institutions to have greater engagement, but they had this fear of doing the wrong thing, afraid that someone would call them out and they, they would be personally embarrassed or there would be reputational damage to the organisation. So uh, hopefully protocols could help um, eradicate that sort of fear. If you go and have a look at the report, you'll see that it goes through an audit of uh, sort of baseline figures like how many galleries refer to the continuous culture's ongoing responsibilities policy or how many employees they have uh, and or wraps. But my focus really is, is going to be on this engagement piece. Now we're doing a roadmap, it, it's out there, it's a 10 year plan and it's about changing, it's really about changing the way these organisations interact and communicate and basically deal with the content that they carry and their connections with Indigenous people. So it's 10 years and at the very earliest, one of the early consultations that I had, I remember sitting there and talking to one of the uh, uh, elders, one of the Indigenous elders who had done a lot of voluntary work over the years working with the museum in her city. And I was saying, I'm doing a 10 year roadmap. And she said to me, well, Terry, first of all, 10 years is not long enough. Add three more zeros, a 10,000 year roadmap is where we need to be focusing on because we cannot let this go. So it's 10 year roadmap, but we must keep it up um, and how we can continue to make change uh, within these institutions. Because, um, you know, the. A lot of the way we perceive ourselves as a country is through the eyes of institutions and collections that cultural institutions hold. And in the past, it's been pretty embarrassing for Indigenous people to see how their ancestors have been uh, referred to and how their body parts or their cultural objects have been stolen and reproduced for science and uh, without any you know, names or without the ancestors even knowing where they're from. So the roadmap takes on five principles that can affect change and it uses those as themes to guide the work. Because the challenge is how do you deal with a sector that might have lots of resources like a national institution to a small aspirant keeping place or a history uh, association to a, a regional or local keeping place. So the principles are where I started as a guide. So reimagining representation is a key point. So acknowledging the past injustices and confronting the hard to tell histories. Indigenous people said nothing about us without us. Let Indigenous people's voices be heard and acknowledging the value of Indigenous knowledge and increasing people working in there, yes, as curators, but also um, as other people working in institutions and having these community-led projects, and also increasing Indigenous audiences. How do we make the institutions more welcoming for Indigenous people, seeing that the content is so rich? It is actually often the most unique points about our, our, our cultural institutions is the, the, the Indigenous content and the Indigenous collections. So the points that relate to um, Indigenous issues, Indigenous collections is 
uh, that spring out of the report is that digital knowledge management should be steered by Indigenous consultation and from an Indigenous worldview and um, much more opportunities to use digital options to find out what's in institutions that could aid repatriation. And there's also the importance of finding balances between safeguarding um, Indigenous content but increasing that digital access because Indigenous people can't often get to institutions and the digital um, uh, access points are important for them. And the keeping places that Indigenous people want to set up on country, how can institutions help with that? What training and support can they give? And Indigenous people should be enabled to interpret collections. The second theme is about embedding Indigenous values into institutions and their core business. So the roadmap uses the Reconciliation Action Plan as a, a point that it could be basically uh, put in through the governance of an institution. It really uh, focuses on the Indigenous cultural and intellectual property protocols that spring out of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it looks at how greater programming interpretation, but how do we get these into the way that we do things? Uh, through strategy, right through to budget. We address cultural safety, get everyone trained on cultural competency and make these spaces welcoming. The third thing is about increasing Indigenous opportunity and that is about bringing people in as staff, cultural advisors and not just always being volunteers but recognising their skills and the importance of the value they bring and developing professional development for people who are in here and championing Indigenous leadership but also opening up uh, procurement opportunities for contractors to engage with the institution. There's also uh, needs to be a shift in the way that we look at collections as being really, really important for Indigenous people. We see them as our ancestors' material, so this notion of museums being the, the gatekeepers and the owners must shift to a two-way caretaking model where we work together. So we're seeing things like MOUs being developed and encouraging uh, people to come in, having cultural inventories and databases, education and training, and not accepting things that have dubious origins. Five is connecting with Indigenous communities. So opening up um, for a greater engagement means that you have to build a trust and strengthen the relationships. So that is uh, often confronting for institutions because they it takes time. So how do, how, how do you factor that into something that might be a you know a project time frame that is locked into funding? It can be often difficult. But have going out to communities, having these cross sectoral collaborations, and returning material and empowering this call that Indigenous people have for national Indigenous spaces as well. And as I said, there'll be changes to uh, the, the policy, which will pick up on most of those themes. And AMAGA is now asking for feedback on that. It'll go through their um, con consultation and their acceptance procedures. It's probably due to be accepted at their AGM coming up at their next conference. So where would we get to? We would like to see you know, self-determination uh, for communities, where communities are uh, able to tell these authentic stories and share their stories, their perspectives. The spaces would be safe, it's welcoming, um, and all those points there. It's about bridging those gaps that I mentioned before. And we've put out three different levels there, using the car analogy again, you can see. Um, going down to the last three years that we'd be really all aligning and putting our foot down and then realigning again so we don't just have an abeyance after the 10th year. And there's also a timeline for organisations to fit into. And it would also be connected to measures that we're looking at the way the RAP can, the Reconciliation Action Plans, uh, provide uh, an opportunity 
through uh, the, its barometer and how it, it includes within its uh, goals measures for um, reporting on, on uh, the organisation achieving those goals. So have a look at that and thank you to anyone who took part in that. I really appreciate your feedback. Now, no one left, so now I'm moving on to copyright. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what is Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. We still use that term in Australia. It did come out of the 1990s draft of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and it's used in Our Culture, Our Future, a large report, which is about 21 years old now, which I worked on many years ago. But it's basically Indigenous people's rights to their heritage. And what is that? It's pretty holistic. It is, I guess it's what Indigenous people need to practice their culture. It comes from place. So one group will have different cultural knowledge than another. It's communal because it's passed down through the years and we all have a right to use it. And uh, it's living. It's not locked in, off in time. And it's also about culture. So you can see I've got a, a map there of everything connected. But you can see already that it's the type of things that are in collections. So if you're looking at the uh, category there that says literary performing and artistic works, you're going to say, well, it's the photographs, the old photographs and the old books that might have been written by anthropologists, by Indigenous people. It's the art that we collect. Documentation of Indigenous people, that's like diaries or field notes and government records, which are not like, from a copyright sense, owned by Indigenous people. Someone else would own it. They might even be in the public domain. Uh, scientific and ecological knowledge. Uh, that it belongs to Indigenous people, but it might be put down in surveys or capture of, of data when you're going out on country talking about species. Cultural property, that's objects that have been collected. Immovable cultural property is knowledge of sites that might be recorded in heritage reports or native title cases. Indigenous ancestral remains, that is DNA or body parts or full human bodies that were collected for science. A really uh, sad part of history and Indigenous people are wanting to have those returned and the spirits laid to rest. And last year, some of you might have followed the, the return of Mungo Man. And then languages. Languages is there because language materials become an important link for Indigenous people today to reclaim languages that have been sleeping. And copyright in you know, the records that might be taken of early people in, in the settlement, you know, diaries of um, uh, William Dawes, for example, uh, out of copyright, but still very much part of um, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And so the rights Indigenous people want is to basically own and control it and benefit from it if it's used commercially, but be attributed for it, so that connection remains, and to prevent it from being treated in a derogatory and offensive way. We have no law in Australia that grants that. We have lots of different customary laws because Indigenous uh, people's laws have existed on this point for thousands of years. The closest thing is probably the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. It's, a, it's, it's as an international document, low on the rung, so it doesn't translate as a law like copyright comes into Australian law uh, by way of the Berne Convention. But you can see here, this is world Indigenous people all getting together to make a statement to say that we have the right to maintain, control and protect and develop our cultural heritage, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression. And then the next few lines go and talk about the content. And what we're seeking is the right to control it as intellectual property. The World Intellectual Property Organisation has had an intergovernmental committee for um, the past 20 years about how intellectual property and TK, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression can deal uh, with this space and the call of Indigenous people and traditional knowledge holders all over the world. And they've not reached a decision yet, but they have draft articles about the protection of TK and TCE. So it is an issue that collections uh, m must be dealing with. And I would say don't wait for the law. Um, go with um, practices um, 
that you can have right now. Just to highlight the differences between copyright and IP, so, uh, sorry, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. Copyright has uh, been around um, since, was it 1710, Statue of Anne's? ice it's been around for 65,000 years. Copyright is very expression-based, material form, and it was explained by Professor um, Chander, I think, it was on the birth of the printing press. But ICIP sort of uh, um, knowledge systems, they are orally based or styles and underlying themes are important. It's not, it's automatically poses a problem there. And then we have copyright being very individual based, the notion of, the, of authorship, or we look for the maker of subject matter other than works. But ICIP is saying it's, it's a communally owned content. Uh, the difference here um, in the law is the case law. We have a case, Bull and Bull and, and r and Textiles, that did look at um, this about the relationship. Uh, if an individual in artist can own copyright in a work that embodies traditional ritual knowledge, what were the rights of the collective? Um, the federal court judgment there said that there is a fiduciary duty owed by the artist as the copyright owner to the clan to deal with the copyright in ways that are consistent with uh, the, the customary law. And for me, that also raises issues about what other copyright owners might fall under having that fiduciary obligations. Could it be anthropologists, for example, photographers or filmmakers or institutions that are making this content available? Copyright is incentive-based, so the economic rights are there except for moral rights. But I said, we want to keep, you know, that woman telling me 10,000 years. It's about cultural rights and continuing to keep um, culture for future generations. And copyright can be assigned, so long as it's in writing. But I said, people want to have it in the group um, and handed down in the group. Copyright is limited 70 years after the death of the author, but for ICIP, it's going to continue. So automatically, the public domain issue comes up between you know, these old songs being deemed in the public domain, but really, it's to, it, in ICIP systems, it's about cultural practice. So the key issues there are forming, you know, that copyright wouldn't belong to a lot of Indigenous people, um, the knowledge is treated in the public domain, the maker, um, might not be known, the community might not be identified, information was collected at a time where Indigenous people weren't given enough information about how it would be used, particularly when you're going back to digitise it. What did those anthropologists or those filmmakers say to the Indigenous communities when they took footage of, or wrote about ceremonies, for example? And then Indigenous communities can't practice their cultural laws and protocols if, they're, if they don't own the copyright. So the impact there, it's, as I said, treated in the public domain and it can be used by others. Deceased images can be used, secret sacred knowledge can be disclosed and there's this weakening and de demeaning treatment of culture that are, um, impacts on cultural practice. So the best practice then is to have a two-level approach to materials and it's looking at copyright but also looking at indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights. And this is where we've been working on protocols. Uh, protocols have been established as like a leading practice um, response to these shortfalls because they can go beyond the law. And I think institutions find them fairly flexible without there being need to, to be a change of law. And they pick up on ethical condu conduct and um, this good faith and respect obligations. Um, and we wrote, it's coming on probably 18 years ago, Australia Council for the Arts developed five art form guides for uh, Indigenous arts creation to promote this respectful recognition of traditional cultural expression when projects are being created. So uh, it is looking at not just getting copyright or looking at the way that copyright might apply to a situation where someone's creating content. It is looking at how you can encourage recognition of Indigenous people being the custodians or the copyright owners. And it's a condition of grant funding. 
Some of you would probably know that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Libraries and Research Network has protocols which look at how you categorise and deal with content in libraries, which was uh, it's probably coming on 20 years now. And Screen Australia's Pathways and Protocols does the same thing for filmmakers who are making films about Indigenous content or with Indigenous people or our Indigenous country. But the work that we do at our firm is we use this True Tracks protocols to help people solve how they deal with Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And it goes one to ten, but it's not like um, the 12 steps where you go step one and go <laughs> to step 12. You've got to know them at the start so you can plan, and they may overlap, but having them in your mind when you're managing and thinking about projects at an early stage is a really good way to uh, basically ensure that, you know, you might not get everything right, but you've given it a good go. So principle one is just respect and acknowledging that Indigenous content is not in the public domain or it's not the copyright belonging to someone else. They have a right to maintain, control, protect and develop it. There's self-determination as well there. Uh, how do the projects that we work on uh, recognise Indigenous people in making decisions? Are they the ones that are uh, the, the writers, the conceivers, the filmmakers? Are they the key creatives? Projects could support self-determination through having advisory committees, but at a much deeper level, can they be Indigenous-led? Um, how, how do we go about that? Principle three, communication, consultation and consent. So the standard is free prior informed consent, um, giving Indigenous people knowledge of the project uh, at an early stage and not just at the end so that they can make decisions. And when um, I've worked with people on this in the past, uh, organisations have shifted from thinking this is really hard because it's such a deep, who do I consult with? I need to identify the right person. What do I say? What do they need to know? I don't even know now what um, might be the end use. Um, the point is, is to start with um, going out and asking people and then build from there and it'll get stronger. There are some guides. Um, there's a global compact guide about free prior informed consent. So it's about um, making sure there's enough information. I mean, people have got to be able to say no prior, um, give people enough time. I remember once getting a call of someone who's going into a community to film and they rang me up on the phone and it was pretty intense ceremony they wanted to film. And the guy rang me up and said, somebody told me I need to talk to you about protocols and clearance forms. And I thought, oh, yeah, OK, I can help you with that. Well, do you want to have a meeting? Oh, when can we meet? Where are you? And he said, oh, well, I'm just going into the community now. And that's way too late. It needs to be much longer. Um, so inform, think about what you've got to say. So the good things and the bad things and consent. So this introduces a whole new level for institutions that might have not have had any clearance forms for this. So how do you record it? Do you take file notes? Are you having a whole new suite of sign-offs that you need to work with? Principle four is interpretation, the right of Indigenous people to basically be the primary guardians and interpreters of their cultures. So it's looking at the terminology we use and what we say and anything confidential getting out there in public, looking at how Indigenous voices can be um, interpreting our collections. Principle five is an integrity and authenticity. So that's picking up on those harmful contexts that are either out of context than the original um, use, which can happen a lot in digital, when you make something digitally available. It was um, said the, the ease of which it's made available can make it uh, be applied and adapted. So um, you need to think about that. And secrecy and confidentiality. So not just things being, this is men's business, this is women's business, or things that should only be you know, known by groups, 
but personal things and might have been recorded in old records, for example, that should not be just put up on a database online. Attribution. So when I was a kid, I used to go to museums and look at stuff and there was always artists unknown on the attribution. Um, a, lot, no, a lot of those uh, ancestors' uh, bodies that are held in collections overseas, we don't know where they came from. To bring them back to rest is really hard. So how do we keep that attribution and make sure that we're always connected as Indigenous people to the content in collections? So it might not be just through a copyright lens where we're attributing the, the, West, you know, the Western knowledge author, the person who wrote it, but the Indigenous person. Now, in the past, people would always attribute the Indigenous contributor as uh, it, it, it was um, the, the Indigenous um, subject. So uh, even though it was totally based on all of their knowledge, so this is about looking at ways that you can you know, attribute them and, and also involve them as being co-authors. Uh, there's also the development of a traditional custodian's notice that's useful, a bit like the copyright sort of notices, but it is um, keeping that connection to a, a community. Eight is benefit sharing. So Indigenous people have the right to share in the benefits of their knowledge and their cultural and intellectual property. So that is obviously economic benefits, but non-economic as well, like access to employment opportunities, uh, copies of materials and payment. Nine is man maintaining Indigenous cultures. So think about how a project might impact on Indigenous people's uh, ability to control their cultural dynamic and will it impact future people, and will people be able to locate the stuff that you record now in the future? And I think that's really important because today a lot of collections hold a lot of material, but none of the kids or the people living today know that their grandmother was involved in that project, uh, whatever. So how do you, uh, when you're doing the projects today, keep in connection and enable that dynamic to continue? especially if you're going back for future uses. Because in here, it's, it's more of this connection and process, which makes it very, very hard for people in institutions when dealing with copyright, because we want to tick off. You know, you, we, lawyers, we like to draft those things. We can consent to everything, all in one go. It's, it's in all media now known and yet to be devised, in perpetuity. But for Indigenous content, it's like you might have to list the uses, it's not going to be totally um, something that you sign off on. You'll have to consult on future uses. Principle 10 is recognition and protection. So it's like using existing laws, contracts, knowing um, about ICIP, having ICIP protocols, <laughs> using traditional custodian's notice, you know, like uh, putting notices in your agreements, your consent forms that link to consent next of kin, but also having avenues for people to give feedback or complaints about how you're dealing with their material so you can resolve it. And this is what successful models uh, look like for now in the absence of there being any standalone law for Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. We would look at IP laws being there, using contracts and protocols all together. And if we all do it, it sets a standard and, you know, People get used to it. And this is where the work of the case studies comes in. And I worked with uh, Karen Manton from the Bachelor Institute, and she's going to talk up next to tell this case study more, more detail. But they were dealing with um, basically putting language resources online for the benefit of communities. And so we developed ICIP protocols, processes and clearance forms there. And there's also another case study which Kirsten Thorpe will present on, the New South Wales Mukatu Hub. Mukatu being a digital space that's for Indigenous groups to reclaim their content and share it in ways that are in accordance with their cultural wishes. And she will talk about the work with the State Library, um, the MOU with UTS, where she is now, and also a Washington State 
um, university. And um, I worked with uh, Kirsten, she brought me in there to work with them on the ICIP protocols in the State Library of New South Wales use, uses the 10 steps in True Tracks. So there they all are. Um, I always just tell people, just put them up and think about them when you're doing work because it will help you think about this space. But in the long term, I still have the vision for there to be changes to the law, which was the main recommendation of our culture, our future. And as I said, we have this UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People still there. How does that get more um, known and embedded within Australian law and policy and our copyright frameworks? But also, IP Australia uh, put out a consultation and a discussion paper about what can be done for protection of Indigenous knowledge. Um, I think that gives an opportunity for institutions to, again, look at uh, can these protocols be a framework for laws? And WIPO, again, is still looking at how they might have an international instrument. But I'm still thinking, even though we have this, um, we, can, we can set it up based on ethics and goodwill, but we must also look at how um, we can have that legislation to back it. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>